Okay, good evening. Tonight we'll be talking into more detail about one of the critical thinking skills, which is called analyzing text. Okay, so you you may want to have out your Rereading America article, the Michael Moore Idiot Nation article, because I'll be using some text from the article as an example, and also one of the handouts from Essay 1 called The Critical Reading, Thinking, and Writing Skills. So as you recall, last time uh, I was lecturing about the critical reading, thinking, and writing skills. So, so just a little review. Uh, you obviously are doing your pre-reading first, where you're getting ready to read, seeing what biases you have, and so forth. Just basically mentally preparing yourself to read about the topic and what you know about the topic and what biases you have about the topic that might uh, create obstacles to your critical thinking. And then you start reading, critically reading the article. And instantaneously, as you read, the human mind cannot retain you know, like if you have a 10 page article, the human mind cannot possibly retain every single bit of information. You can't really memorize everything. So in a way you must summarize. So summarize is technically not a critical reading, thinking or writing skill technically, but it's actually a necessary precursor or prerequisite. So you have to be able to summarize text or basically be able to understand text in your own words. So it's a good idea as you read to annotate, to basically try to restate, restate text in a simple way I believe Ms. Zapp has taught you a lot about uh, taking notes where you're, where you're uh, restating text and then you also critically comment on the text. But uh, you do restate the text to help you understand. And that's why also, and you notice in homework assignment one, I was telling you in the Gibson reading, you know, the academic conversation reading is not to copy the text or depend on quotes because I want to see you understand the text. Rather than, being, rather than seeing you be able to copy text, I want to see you be able to restate what she has in her own words. So uh, rather than seeing a Gibson uh, Gibson writing, I want to see your writing, right? Be able to restate it in your own simpler and, under, and understanding words where you can understand yourself. So it's really good to be able to understand texts where you're basically boiling down eventually what the author's thesis statement is, uh, what are their main points or main ideas, general ideas that support uh, the author's thesis statement, and what are some of the key or significant examples that support the main points. You know, the examples are more detailed or maybe more detailed bits of information for the text that support the author's uh, main points. And the main points are more general ideas, but not quite specific examples. So as, as you do that, you're, you're basically summarizing the text. And right away, the human mind is very powerful. Right away, maybe within a microsecond, you're actually you're starting to be critically thinking and reading and thinking and writing right away. And uh, you're, you're getting into the critical thinking skills. Uh, you, you'll, you'll be interpreting text. You'll be uh, synthesizing a text, which we'll talk about later, interpreting and synthesizing. You'll be analyzing a text. I think you heard that word a lot and you already do it already, but we'll get into that. And you'll eventually be evaluating texts, like giving an opinion with your support. But let's get into one of the very key skills uh, that often is synonymous with critical thinking, right? It's like sometimes when people say, I need to analyze more, they're, they're really think they're really, in a way, they're talking a lot about critical thinking. It's kind of interchangeable because it's so closely related because the word critical uh, came from uh, the Greek terms, Greek term kritikos, and also the Latin term uh, kritikos, kritikos, the very similar terms there. Uh, it came from Greek and Latin terms. Uh, it means to basically to separate elements, and that's basically what analysis is. So as you take a look at the handout uh, from uh, what I attach to essay number one, analysis is basically taking a piece of text and being able to separate it into its parts or elements to better understand it and to discuss, critically discuss those parts and elements. So there are some examples of text. So, so basically, you can literally take text you see uh, in, in uh, a written down text and basically break it into parts, like Gibson's speech. In these conversations, sometime a spark is kindled, which henceforth nurses itself. So you can analyze that text. You know, instead of, sometimes we run into trouble when we write essays. Sometimes you, you may think, oh, just give your opinion on that quote, right? So sometimes students might just uh, give their, oh, that, that quote is really great about uh, uh, students talking to each other and they, they learn a lot and then, then they, they can write, they can learn a lot and basically be able to be better educated, right? But then the student is just struggling, right? Because they only wrote a short essay and they don't really know what more to write. Because the problem is they didn't really analyze uh, the individual elements uh, of her speech, right? If you analyze, you can actually make your, think more about the topic and make your essays longer if you analyze. So basically you can analyze her her or quote the, or Plato's quote there, you can analyze conversations, right? 
uh, you could break down uh, the words, the, the key words. Conversations can be uh, conversations with teachers, conversations between students, conversations between students and others, conversations between students and uh, other people in the college community. So you can see right there, you have a lot of different ideas, right? Conversations is not only just a conversation in the classroom. It could be conversations uh, with other people, counselors, teachers, uh, peers, things like that. And of course, you can have your written conversations too. You can actually extend the term, right? So literally, conversations may, may just mean oral conversations in a dictionary. But if you read between the lines or you read underneath the text, which is not directly stated, conversations can go beyond that, like into written conversations. Uh, you can analyze, start analyzing more. Sometime, you know, the, the significance of the word sometimes, spark, kindled, which is like getting going. Henceforth, nurse itself. So you can see right there, uh, if you analyze the individual words and discuss those words, you can get more essay topics, like, like more main points to discuss and more examples to discuss. So right there, you can see right away, instead of having a short example, you can, have, you can suddenly create three, four, five, six paragraphs, long paragraphs, and even break, break down a long paragraph into more paragraphs. You know, like break down the main point into three paragraphs instead of one paragraph. So basically, you can basically extend you're writing by an adult by breaking down an article or breaking down text in an article into uh, key ideas to discuss those things just from a literal sense, like just reading words off of a page. You can discuss that there too. Uh, you can see that. And then you can bring the Gibson ideas of helping others, which is part of nurses itself. You know, how, how sparks uh, nurses inward, but it also nurses outward and also the idea of academic freedom. So you have a lot of ideas that you can basically uh, get into. With analysis okay so uh, let's get another example of analysis too let's take a look at the Michael Moore text uh, and we're trying to analyze well, let me just give an example here let's take a look at page number 123 the last paragraph so let's get out our Michael Moore text idiot nation and let's just analyze this little piece of text he states as Americans we have quite a proud tradition of being represented by ignorant high-ranking officials. In 1956, President Dwight D. Eisenhower's nominee as ambassador to Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, was unable to identify either the country's prime minister or its capital during his Senate confirmation hearings. But not a problem. Maxwell Gluck, you know, the, the nominee was confirmed anyway. So right away, you can actually analyze uh, the key elements there, right? So basically, the, what, the first key element there is our tradition of, of uh, nominee uh, being represented by ignorant high-ranking officials there, right? It's a little bit sarcastic there, but, but why does America basically have a tradition of uh, being represented by uh, officials who are not very bright? So you can get into that word, that, that little part to analyze. And then also, the president is also nominating... Uh, the, the uh, ambassador who did not know these basic key facts. So there, right there, you can see, you can analyze that second part where, where the, uh, the nominee is not really understanding uh, simple facts about the, the country. He is supposed to be an ambassador too. Okay, and then uh, the third part, uh, not a problem. He was nominated anyway. Okay, he, he was confirmed anyway. So, so right, right there, you have some issues about... Uh, the, the hearing there, uh, how how he was nominated, right? So you can literally look look at the key parts. Basically, the key parts are our tradition, which more talked about, uh, the fact that that ambassador nominee could not understand basic key facts, and and then the it, it, but as a result of that, he was still not nominated, right? So you right there, I, I identified three key lit, key facts or key elements of the text, literally, right? If you read the text literally, okay. <laughs> Now, there's something, uh, another part of analysis called reading between the lines. A lot, a lot of students say that, right? They're saying that I really need to learn how to read between the lines. That is part of analysis, reading between the lines, being able to read between the lines. Uh, what does that mean? Basically, you have the literal meaning. Okay, let's take an example. Black lives matter, okay? You have the literal meaning, okay, of something. Yet, you also have the, there, there's meaning that the author has uh, to, to his words, or her words and her words beneath the text, right? That's not literally stated. If there's actually meaning uh, to the text that's not literally stated, but that's underneath the text or hidden, uh, hidden uh, fr from the literal part of the text that you see, but it's also part of, of the author's meaning there. And you have to figure that out too, because it is a part of the text. 
you may not see it on the text itself, but it's still part of the text. And you have to figure out what the author's assumptions are, uh, what, what meaning the author's attaching to that. It, there's, there's a little detective work that you had to do, but you can find that out. Now let's go back to the Michael Moore article, right? So literally, uh, I picked out three things that you can analyze, but there's also other things about the text. Uh, there's other hidden meanings that Moore may have, right? Uh, notice that, 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 for example, the nominee was a male, right? Maxwell Gluck. Well, why are the nominees always male, right? So Michael Moore might say, yeah, that, that's a good point, right? Uh, why why, why uh, does America tend to nominate uh, males? Or why do the president tend to nominate these males who do not know anything about the subject, right? So what about a more qualified female candidates, right, who know about the subject, right? Like a student who has a master's degree, a woman has a master's degree in international policy at UC Berkeley. Why wasn't she considered, right? Why does the president consider someone who's better qualified, who would know all that stuff, right? So so it's not really mentioned that a woman was not nominated, right, uh, for, for, for this position by uh, President Eisenhower. But underneath there, you can see right there, you can see our tradition, right? Uh, that that's a fair point to do, right? That's a fair question to ask because it's basically the public process where the president is nominating these people, and right there you can see another thing that comes up, right? The president is nominating people. Why is the president personally nominating people when the president is, is nominating someone who's not qualified? Is the president really qualified to nominate someone? Obviously, this person was not qualified. Why is the president doing that? Like, should, should look at look at the process, right? Maybe the process is wrong there too. So right away, there's hidden meaning that's not directly stated. Uh, by the author, right? But there could be hidden meaning about the fairness of, of the, the nominating process, uh, men, men versus women, the equality there. There's actually a lot of hidden meaning too that you need to bring it out to the reader, enlighten the reader with to talk about there. So there's a lot of opportunity for you to be creative. And you could argue that it's still relevant, even though it's not literally stated, it's still part of the text because these are valid issues because they're, they're attached uh, to, to uh, the nomination process in itself, right? And then you could also get into the nature of ignorance too, right? Things he doesn't really state, but you can go beyond ignorance and, and read between the lines and actually to delve into the issue of ignorant uh, uh, high-ranking officials or, or why do we have that proud tradition? Does that show ignorance of the American people themselves too, right, on the issue too? So you could really go get into that. Just about one quote alone, you could write a, literally a whole essay on that, right? And that points to your truth, right? Sometimes students say, oh... Uh, I want to be like business writing. I don't want to be repetitive in my writing, right? I, I want to be succinct. I want to be able to condense my writing, cut it down. Yeah, that, that's good. Like business writing is good. Sometimes uh, our writing tasks, we must be succinct and condensed and not waste time because people do not want to keep on hearing you talk on and on. However, uh, we have to realize that college writing and academic writing is a search for the truth, right? So basically, the search for the truth may require you to give a lot of your reader a lot of examples, a lot of explanations, a variety of explanations. And it's not repetitive. As long as you're giving different examples, different explanations, you're delving into the text with different different topics, different little subtopics related to one topic, you're not being repetitive. So again, you're not really going on and on with the same thing. If someone says you're going on and on, it's just that their inability to understand that there are a lot of multiple ideas uh, uh, within one topic, right? So again, that that's a something against the reader, not necessarily you. So again, uh, the reason why I'm assigning long essays is not to be mean, it's to challenge you, to push you to write more, right? You may not really like or really uh, be crazy about writing six or seven page essays or even longer, right? In graduate school, you might have to write 20 or 30 page essays, but it's good to do because you want to search for the truth because basically in real life, you're going to be required to give many different examples to support your ideas because a person's not going to believe you. They're not, they're not just going to believe you. You just give one example and you think you get it. Uh, oh, this is a essay. I just I, I basically gave my three main points, a couple examples. It's a perfect essay. I didn't have any grammar mistakes. Okay, yeah, you might get an A. The teacher will give you A. But in real life, uh, other human beings are not easily convinced. You, you had to be really creative by you know analyzing, going, reading between the lines, not just literally convince them. You had to basically show your smarts by kind of helping them to also, uh, you know, bringing them into not being aggressive against them, but literally reading, uh, literally reading between, literally reading the essay and analyzing and also reading between the lines. Now, let's go to a controversial topic, Black Lives Matters, and see how we can read between the lines to try to resolve that, right? So when you hear the words Black Lives Matter, what do a lot of uh, people who object to that say? They say, oh, uh, uh, our Declaration of Independence stated that uh, all human beings are created equal, right? All men are created equal, right? So that, that's kind of sexist there, right? But all men are created equal, therefore, all human life should be valued. So we all agree on that, right? All human life 
should be created equal. All human life should be valued. So they get very mad, right, when they hear Black Lives Matters, right? Because they say that, oh, you're the same. Black, only Black Lives Matters, right? You're the same. Black Lives Matters, but 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 so therefore, what are all lives matters, right? So that's a retort, right? Someone says Black Lives Matter. Someone replies, all lives matter because you know we're all equality, right? However, if you read between the lines, if you look at the term Black Lives Matters, you have to read the underlying assumptions beyond Black Lives Matters because people who support Black Lives Matters, one of their assumptions is that, yes, we agree. We actually agree that all lives do matter. That's just a given, right? That, that's just a no-brainer that all lives matters. However, the issue of Black lives are so important nowadays with the police brutality uh, against Blacks, uh, very unfair is that we now must need to focus on Black Lives Matter right now because of unfairness and brutality, right? Because it's very unfair with the killings of Black people, especially by police officers. And it could, a lot of it could be unjustified. We must focus on Black Lives. So in a way, the people who support Black Lives Matter, they, they all agree that all lives matter. But however, that's the assumption is that all lives do matter. However, with, with, the, with the issue of police brutality, we must focus on Black Lives Matters, right? So they, so people who just say, uh, all lives matters, you have to convince them that there's underlying assumptions beyond the slogan, right? The slogan was just created as a general idea. However, underneath the slogan or reading between the lines, there's actually more to that term, right? So in a way, all lives matter, all lives matter responders and Black Lives Matters are actually in agreement in a way, right? It's just that we don't really understand or people who say all lives matter, they may not quite understand that there are underlying assumptions already, right? And, and, and basically, we should talk about that. So you don't you want to tell them that, but not be aggressive. You want to bring that in. You want to understand. Yeah, they're they're actually not. Uh, they're not racist people. You want to say, hey, they're they're actually just be, be being believing that all human beings are created equal, and they're just wondering about that, and they're getting outraged by that. But you want to bring them in and say, yeah, we understand that. But however, uh, let's just take a look at the idea or, or theory or concept. The concept of Black Lives Matter is we had to understand the assumptions. We had to read between the lines. We had to understand every aspect of that, right? So it, that, that would be great to write an essay on, right? So I invite you to write an essay on that, explain that, and bringing in the opponents in, right? Because you don't want to like try to divide people further, but that would be great to do that, right? People have written essays on that, but usually when you get TV shows, people just scream back and forth and division is created, right? But when you get into academic when we have a, a community of thinkers who analyze things and who are, have open minds and think about different sides we can discuss this issue intelligently and that's at the heart of analysis right you writing essays where you can bring in your your opponents you know get them to understand things and not be aggressive against them or name call them and basically bring them in and convince them that your side is right or even invite them right you know invite their other ideas and you may be convinced by them you may be convinced that they have some good points too but at the end of the day you may disagree with them, or you may partially agree with them, or you actually may modify your view, but it's your choice. At least the important thing is to be open-minded, as I keep on repeating myself, right? As, and to be a good, to be open-minded, you have to be a great analyzer, be able to separate texts or have multiple perspectives, right? The critic, the heart of critical thinking, very closely related to analyzing, right? Or analyzing is to be able to see, separate things, be able to see different sides to an issue, different aspects of the issue, right? And not being repetitive, right? You know, you're you're right. You you but you basically want to bring out the complexity issue. Don't say, oh, you know, don't let your opponent say, oh, we talk. You keep on talking about the same thing over and over again, right? But you want to talk about different things. All issues are complex. They're not going to be solved uh, overnight. Uh, you got to really bring out different things. And this idea of underlying assumptions or reading between the lines, a lot of people just don't. They, they don't really understand that. Or they don't have the patience to believe that because they read literally, right? You had to understand that all language is not just reading literally. You had to read underneath that. You had to go read between the lines. And between the lines is invisible, right? So therefore, it's hard to figure out, right? And people may not understand that or they just don't have the patience to that or they don't have the education to understand that or, they, or their viewpoint or they may be, may be very biased or very aggressive against that. You had to try to bring them in. You may not be successful, but at least you're trying, right? You know, you're not just not yelling at each other. On, on opposite sides of a protest field, right? You're basically trying to bring them in, right? So basically, that is analysis. So you will get a chance in the future homework assignment, the next homework assignment, to analyze a piece of Michael Moore text. So look through the text uh, and pick any any piece of text that you find interesting that you can write a one-page paragraph on and be able to analyze, be able to present that quote and analyze that quote, be able to write a very well-organized, well-developed, coherent paragraph organizing that. So that will be one of the questions. So be ready there. 
uh, right until you get the homework assignment. You just want to pick a quote that, that you like, and you'll be able to do that. A later assignment, when we, I'll talk about synthesizing later, you're going to be able to synthesize or link the anion text to your life or, or the lives of others, things like that. When we get into the synthesizing, we're going to talk about Gene Anion and how you can synthesize uh, text from Gene Anion article, so you'll get a chance to do that. But the next homework assignment will be uh, one of the questions will focus on analyzing a piece of Michael Moore, the Michael Moore text. And I might be asking questions about Black Mice Ladder. What, what do you think about what I was analyzing? You know, you may agree with what I say. You may disagree. Or you may have additional perspectives. But you'll, you'll get a chance to talk about that, too. It's a very controversial topic. But until then, I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Good night.